Hi guys, my name is Apostle Clark Abood, and today I want to talk about our church's belief in soul sleep. Um, this is a pretty controversial doctrine. Um, a lot of people just reject it based off the fact that Jehovah's Witnesses and Seventh-day Adventists believe in it, and just because um, heretical groups believe in something that is true doesn't mean that that doctrine is bad. You know, you don't just throw away Jesus because... Joel Osteen brings them up or you don't throw away baptism just because Catholics do it. So um, the doctrine of soul sleep is essentially this, that when you die, you go into a rest. You're not conscious. You are asleep in the grave awaiting for the resurrection. And when you are resurrected, you will be awakened at that point in time. So we're going to be going over several scriptural passages tonight. I handed that out to you guys so you could keep along with it all. Because I'm going to be going through it kind of fast because I'm going to be answering all the main object objections to soul sleep. So this is probably going to be quite a long sermon. But hopefully we can save some time on it. So let's begin with our belief that a person is made up of a body, soul, and spirit. We don't believe in just body and spirit. Now, um, from 1 Kings chapter 17, 21 to 23 in your little pamphlet. And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried unto the Lord and said, O Lord my God, I pray thee, let this child's, child's soul come into him again. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came back into, came into him again, and he revived. So from this passage... Um, we see that the soul is not this idea of I have a body and a spirit that makes a soul. No, a soul is its own unique thing, and that is what a person is. A person is the soul. The spirit is the breath that a person has, and the body is just the body that we inhabit right now. So now let's look at the scriptures about what happens when we die. Job chapter 14, 12 to 14. So man lieth down and rise not, till the heavens be no more. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Oh, that thou wouldest hide me in the grave, that thou wouldest keep me secret, until thy wrath be past, that thou wouldest appoint me a set time, and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? All the days of my appointed time, I will wait till my change come. Psalm 6.5 for in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Psalms 39. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Psalms 88, 10, 12. Wilt thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead arise and praise thee? So, uh, so long. I can't say that word. <laughs> shall thy love kindness be declared in the grave? Or thy faithfulness in the destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Psalms 115, 17. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalms 146, 2-4. While I live, will I praise the Lord? Will I sing praises unto my God, while I have any being? Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth and return to his, his earth in the very day his thoughts perish. Ecclesiastes 9, 5. For the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. Neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is, for, is forgotten. And finally, Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with all thy might. For there is no work, nor device nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave, whither thou go. Now let me go ahead and answer the objections. And from those passages that we just read, we see that the dead are not praising God, they're not hearing the gospel or anything like that. They are in a sleep, they're unconscious, and they're not doing anything at that moment. They're just asleep. So the first objection I want to answer is that the... Uh, the claim that upon death, Christians go straight to heaven, and to be in heaven is not the soul sleep. No! Absent from the body and present no! with the Lord. So, this is from 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 
This is Paul's statement. So the first thing you need to do is, um, this passage is used to say, as soon as you're dead, you're with the God. You're with God because if you're absent from the body, then you must be present must with be the Lord. So let's uh, look at the context of this, and then we're going to look at some passages that give um, insight onto it. So Second Corinthians chapter five, verses one to three. For we know that in a, if our fleshly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed we shall not be found naked. So Paul here is talking about the resurrection. Our resurrected, glorified body that is in heaven will be clothed with um, at the resurrection and he states that we're not going to be found naked so it's we're not going to be going to heaven as a disembodied spirit or soul we don't go to heaven until we receive those clothes yes what if i say that well maybe he's being metaphorical and he's saying that well this is the same uh terminology used in jude with talking about the angels with them leaving heaven and then receiving a new, uh, I believe it's habitation. It's the same word being used. Habitation. Yeah, because in Genesis 6, you have the sons of God with mm-hmm. the daughters Just of men. Yeah. And they, so they, have, they don't have their an, angelic body anymore. They, they switch that with a different kind. Um, and so, yeah, in 2 Corinthians 5, if you want to read, you're, you know, personally, you can see the him talking more about the resurrection. So... He, so Paul then goes on to say in verse 8, We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. So let me read a couple passages that give more insight into this. So Daniel chapter 12, verse 2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. In John five twenty six to 29, For as the Father has life in him, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, that he give him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So we see not until the last day will they even hear the voice of God. So they're not hearing God right now in the grave. Okay, let me uh, read this passage again. Camera turned off. All right, so Isaiah 26, verses 19. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body. Shall they arise, awake and sing. He that dwell in dust, for thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. So we see at the resurrection, they are praising, they are... um, they are singing and not prior to this so we're going to see that paul's statement that absent from the body and present with the lord is actually teaching soul sleep so let's compare it to hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 and as it is appointed unto men once to die but after this the judgment so who is our judge jesus Jesus, yeah so when we die, are we going to go immediately to the great, great white throne judgment to be judged? No. no. There's a point in time when that judgment happens. So there is this, this gap in time. And so what is Paul saying here? Paul's saying that when he dies, when he awakes, he's going to be present with the Lord at the twinkling of an eye. So Paul here is, is teaching soul sleep. Obviously, we are not going to heaven immediately upon death. We're going to see some more passages about that. So the the next, the second object, objection, second objection is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And they say this talks about conscience torment. And this is a fairly common argument, but it's just uh, a lack of careful reading for this parable. So let's look at some of the aspects of this parable for us to make sense of uh where this and where this is taking place so from luke 16 is where the parables found let's look at verse 22 and it came to pass that the beggar died 
and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. Uh, Mana, did you notice anything about um, a time or mention of when this exactly no. occurred? No, it's a, it's a parable, so it could take place in the past, present, or future. Yeah, and then you have the angels carrying away Lazarus, but not the rich man. So we have this... I guess I would assume that that would be when yeah. the law was still in effect. Because good, you go to heaven, bad, you don't. But we we have this distinction, and we're gonna be I'm gonna be reading some passages that make sense of why okay. only Lazarus is taken up by the angel, not the rich man. So, Mark thirteen, verse twenty seven, and they, and then shall he send his angels and shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the outmost part of the earth to the outmost part of the heavens. So, um, this is talking about um, the the second coming when. Um, or what you want, may call the rapture. And so um, we see the angels are gathering up God's elect. Matthew chapter 13, verses 49 to 50. So shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then Matthew 8, 11 to 12. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom uh, shall be but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we see Abraham being mentioned. We see the angels separating people to be gathered together with Abraham, Isaac, and other yeah. Is there ever a mention in the scripture um, where, you know, the angels take up a person in heaven in, in like the Old Testament as um, opposed to the New? Because I only know that it's mentioned in the Gospels, obviously. I would have to think think about it. I'm not, nothing on the top of my head okay. comes up like that. So, uh, and then Luke 13, 27, 28, but he shall say, I tell you, I know you not henceforth you are. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you shall see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and you yourself thrust out. So here we see Lazarus being taken by the angels to Abraham's bosom at the time of the harvest of the wheat and the tares. So this, this parable is taking place during the millennium reign. So we have the rich man in outer darkness. We see him weeping. We don't see the gnashing of teeth specifically in this parable, but... You can assume there's probably other people in there, but it's dark. If it's outer darkness, he probably doesn't see, see others yeah, out there. But he's able to see. He's looking up, and this place, outer darkness, we it would be within the earth. It's in it's mentioned within Hades, and when you're looking at the Greek of the New Testament. Okay. So yeah, that's why I said that. So uh, Luke, let's look at the parable some more. So Luke chapter 16, 24 to 26, and he cried and said. Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the, dip the tip of my tongue in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou hast in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. So from here we see a separation of the weed and tares. They can't intermingle any longer. Um, let's see. We see that now Lazarus is being rewarded. So when do, when do people receive the reward? And when do people receive blessings? So... Uh, Luke chapter fourteen fourteen, and thou shalt be blessed, for thy cannot re recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Mm -hmm. Matthew twenty six, uh, Matthew sixteen twenty seven, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall reward every man according to his works. So this passage gives more insight that this is taking place when rewards and punishments are being dealt out first so would you say that is fair for someone who was born 
you know, 2,000 years ago to be suffering and then someone that is wicked now and dying and suffering for them, for the person born earlier to suffer longer than the person born more recently. Does, doesn't scripture say, like, you store up riches in heaven? Yeah, you store up riches. Would, so would, do you think that God would punish someone more based off how early they were born compared to being born later yeah. in the future? No, you, you, if you have this idea that people are suffering currently, then you have basically God not really giving out justice yeah. accordingly. He's just doing it based off whoever dies first, yeah. you know, and they get it worse than someone who dies mm -hmm. later on in the future. So basically we see all this parable is talking about is just the millennium reign. That outer darkness is taking place at Israel. Um, this is before the wicked are resurrected and experience the lake of fire and yeah so the third objection is jesus preaching to the spirits in prison another so this is a objection saying that when jesus was dead he was awake he was conscious and also stating that um though this that the the spirits that he is preaching to are spirits of human beings who have died and their that their conscience and that this preaching that is being done is of the gospel. So to begin, we need to see where human spirits go upon death. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7 says, And then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So where does their spirit go? Return to God who gave it. Yeah, where is God? In yeah, in heaven. <laughs> All right. Ecclesiastes 3.21. You, you listening? Mm -hmm. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goes downward to the earth? So, is, is this spirit prison, is Hades up in the earth? Or is it, I mean, is it upward or is it downward? This is downward. Yeah, it's downward. So, let's, uh, let's double check that. It's Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9. Now that he is... Now that he ascended, was it, was it that, uh, sorry, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. So people are trying to say that, oh yeah, Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth and he preached the spirits who according to Ecclesiastes 3.21 goeth upward, not downward. So these are not human spirits that he is preaching to. So let's get that dealt with first off. So this is not a proof so of, a, of that their conscience of a human beings their conscience. So these spirits that are being talked about are the fallen angels from Genesis six, the sons of God, and Second Peter two verse four talks more about this that these are these fallen angels that are in the, the everlasting chains uh, until the great day so now let's look at first peter 3 18 and 19 for christ also has once suffered for sins and the just for the unjust that he might bring us to god being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the spirit by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So in that, does it mention that was being preached as a gospel? No. It was not mentioned, yeah. And when when I was translating this, yeah, that's the verse that when I was translating this, this passage, like whenever I came across preaching, it was always like associated with the gospel. But yeah. this is one of those ex exceptions. And we also see that he was quickened by the spirit. Mm -hmm by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. So he was quickened, and then he went and began to preach. So he was brought back to life, and then began the preaching to the spirits in prison. So this is not saying... So he this, was already alive before he, he was alive. Yes, yeah, so he was alive after those three days, and him preaching to the dead is not during those three days of him being in the tomb. It's, it's afterwards. So Jesus... This is this, so. This shows that Jesus was, and he doesn't. There's no mention of Jesus being doing anything during those three days. Mm -hmm. uh, so we see, yeah. 
So we see that. So um, so what was he preaching? I'm going to say he was proclaiming his victory over the devil and over the principalities and everything like that. Yeah. So when it, when it says that Jesus um, preached to the spirits in the prison, yeah. uh, or like proclaimed his, preaches the spirits yeah. in the prison, what, um, what is the Greek context of that specific word? Because I know that there's preaching which would be associated with good news. Well, preaching is any proclam- proclamation. Pro- yeah, that, that's all the word means. It doesn't. It didn't go into detail. On no, the it, there's no means. detail whatsoever about what is being preached. Okay. Just that he's proclaiming something to them. That's all that's stated okay. in that. Yeah. So um, let's look at First Corinthians two one, two eleven. I mean, First Corinthians two eleven. For what man know it? For what man knoweth the things of man? save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. So um, without the spirit, with without a man having a spirit, can he know anything? No. No. The spirit, without without the spirit, the soul and the body, they're, they're asleep. There's there's nothing going on there up, up, up top. So, all right. So, um, I'm realizing that we're spending a lot of time going through these and there's just so much I don't want to overload you guys anymore you guys are overloaded so we're going to pick up in a part two on soul sleep and we're going to be finishing up the last couple of objections to the doctrine so uh, with that being said let's go ahead and pray uh, for the nation and enjoy the Lord's, uh, Lord's Supper